conversation around this subject, holy sexuality. Uh, in our lesson, we find from Corinthians, uh, Paul uh, does something interesting. You, of course, know that Paul writes a pretty decent percentage of the New Testament, and many of Paul's letters are designed to address a particular issue. We also find that some of Paul's letters are designed to shape our theology. You see in 1 Corinthians, Paul is really writing to a church that is a very gifted and extremely powerful church. However, uh, giftings and power uh, does not dismiss the reality that we have challenges uh, and that we have struggles because the church is literally a hospital. And so Paul does something interesting in this particular letter. He steps into chaos and really, really drops some truth bombs on this Christian community uh, that was experiencing the explosive power of God in a tremendous way. What is interesting about the church at Corinth was Corinth was a city that was famous for moral behavior. Uh, if we were to take Corinth and compare it to today, uh, it was like the Vegas of its time, uh, where anything went. Prostitution was a regular part of religious practices. And there are those in this particular community, particularly in Corinth, they believe that participating uh, in prostitution would bring them good fortunes and blessings from their God. So what Paul does is Paul tells them that their bodies are sacred temples of the Holy Spirit and it must be treated with much respect look at your name and say stop disrespecting your body so Paul is basically saying guys it is time to rise above the mess and make a decision to live differently than you have in the past and so Paul steps in in this particular letter uh, and he steps in to correct the false belief and explain the Christian view of sexual immorality Paul argues Jesus came to redeem a broken sexuality. It is my heartfelt belief uh, that God is just as concerned about our sexual brokenness as he is with any other affliction. I believe the Father is just as concerned about sexual brokenness as he is with cancer. I believe that God is just as concerned about our porn addictions as he is our nicotine addictions. I believe God God is just as concerned about our same-sex attraction dilemma as he is with our willful sins. I believe God is just as concerned about the secret affairs as he is with your hidden struggles. And because there are those of us in the room uh, that's wrestling with the intersection of our faith and suffering within our sexuality. You have told yourself specifically in this teaching series and even maybe you're a part of this church but you're wondering if the God that we're preaching about is big enough for the problems that you're experiencing in this area of your life but I remember the words of a prophet in Isaiah who said the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to preach the good tidings unto the meek he has sent me to bind up the broken hearted to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of prison doors to those who are bound in other words Jesus Jesus came to change uh, your current condition. Last week we uncovered uh, an important truth of uh, the difference between sex and sexuality. Everybody say there's a difference between sex and sexuality. Sexual sex. So while sex involves physical, biological, and physiological aspects, sexuality encompasses our behaviors, our identity, our orientation, and our, our attitude. And today, much like uh, the ancient church uh, at Corinth, some people believe that sexual behavior was simply a biological function and was a moral, regardless of whether it occurred within the context of marriage and, and the struggles that many are wrestling with today is the fact that sexual issues are ultimately spiritual issues when our sexuality is confusing God becomes confusing the thing here's the thing you and I have made a decision to create a version of God that we can accept We've created a version and an image of God that we fall in love with most. And that God that we have created is designed to affirm what ain't God. 
the Bible says God's ways are beyond or past finding out. So even when you think you've discovered him, you've missed him. It's confusing. We don't get to create the gods we agree with most. As a matter of fact, look at what Jeremiah says in Jeremiah 10, 14. He says, everyone is senseless and without knowledge. Every goldsmith is shamed by, look at that, his idols. Look at that. He says, the images he make are fraud. They have no breath in them. They are worthless. The objects of mockery. When judgment comes, they will perish. And so what Jeremiah is emphasizing is the foolishness of creating idols and false gods. Revealing that these creations are fraudulent and cannot replace the true God. The Bible says, for God is a spirit. And they that worship him must what? Worship him in spirit and in truth in other words God is revealed through relationship God is revealed in time God is revealed in seasons which means there's something you're going through right now that God is using to reveal himself Lord Lord have mercy no no every time you think you figured him out he reveals himself in a whole nother way he was one way when you had a job he's another way when you don't have one he reveals Reveals himself in a unique way. So God is revealed over time. Somebody shout, God, reveal yourself to me. Throughout church history, Christians have understood that God's love doesn't mean he blindly accepts or overlook our sin. However, when the modern church speaks of God's love, it is often in a more humanistic self-serving light that gives us liberty to live exactly the way we prefer and still claim relationship with the holy god according to sociologists david kinnaman and gabe lyons authors of a book called unchristian they they argue that as christians we have an image problem we have an image problem through extensive interviews with teenagers and adults, young adults. They have discovered that many outsiders feel we are hypocritical, saying one thing, doing another. And they are skeptical of our moral superior attitudes. In other words, we fake to be something we not. And then we put theology on top of that. Ah, and so, so they say Christians are pretending to be unreal, conveying a polished image that is not accurate. The church has a public relations crisis uh, and a spiritual crisis. And, and this is what is evident in the church at Corinth. Like Corinth, we are blinded by cultural norms. Some Corinthians meant well, but visiting prostitutes violated core scriptural teachings and their relationship with the Messiah. And today, even today, there are those of you in the room, relationships offer an alternative lifestyle like open and polyamorous relationships, secret affairs, late night hookups, and sneaky links. They're all seen as normal, but they're spiritually damaging. I know you might be sitting next to your sneaky link. Just blink and you're going to get delivered today. A link up secretly, but you don't really have a secure relationship. Y'all are just sex partners. Oh, look at the young church today. Look at the young church today. So y'all are sex partners and you don't realize that after you're done, you're heavier. You have to evaluate what remains when I'm done. This is why it's hard for you to hear God. This is why it's hard for you to be led by God. Because you're too heavy to hear. That what was going on in the church at Corinth. They were visiting prostitutes uh, and they thought they were honoring God and receiving good fortune uh, by giving in to cultural norms. And Paul says, uh, not so. Not so. So, so just look at your neighbor and say, it's going to be okay. So, tell him, just break up with him after church. Just break up with him after church. Break up with him after church. After church. 
after church. Let's get them saved first. Let's get them saved. Amen. Okay. All right. Here's some hard facts about sexual behaviors and belief that exist among many Christians today. Y'all ready? Can we go deeper? All right. First thing, 41% of Christians believe that cohabitation is a pretty dope idea. Living together unmarried, having sex together, it's pretty cool to do that. Let's have fun together. And here's the thing, y'all are doing time together and not life together. You can't receive interest where there's no covenant. Oh, did you hear what I just said? It's like having a savings account and you're pouring resources in, but you can't extract any interest. Because, oh, because it's something about covenant that brings God in. The Bible says a man that finds a wife, he finds a good thing and what? He obtains favor from the Lord. That's what you're doing is you're spending money on something that has no value and you can't pull interest from it. So y'all are practicing marriage. You're fixing his plate and he didn't even ask you to marry him. Y'all done bought houses together. Y'all paying bills together. You got bank accounts together. The devil is a liar. Why are you giving somebody your social security number, but they won't take your last name? You got whole mortgages together. You got a 30-year commitment with somebody that hadn't even got on one knee. You have more faith in your FHA loan than you do covenants. That's your problem. It's because cohabitation gives you an option to leave on your terms. Covenant makes you stay in when it gets hot in the kitchen. 60% of Christians on dating websites say, I'm available. DM me. Shoot me a pic. Send me a photo. Y'all quiet. Look at you. Uh huh. I know where you're at. I know exactly where you're at. Some of y'all need a purge in your cell phone history. You got too, in, too many memories and images and fantasies that are harassing your future and your spiritual development. And no wonder you caught up in the link. It is because there's a stronghold that's on your life and that soul tie is trying to keep you bound. But I decree and declare that in the name of the Lord Jesus, that stronghold has to come up off you. 32% of men between the ages of 18 and 30 have admitted to having an addiction to pornography. 54% of Christians Christians believe that homosexuality should be accepted rather than discouraged. It is in 1 Corinthians that is designed to correct many of these erroneous views. First Paul does something. He emphatically and categorically argues that sexual immorality is wrong. Look at what he says. He says, you see that? He says, food is for the stomach and the stomach for food. And God will destroy both one and the other. Look at it. The body is not meant for sexual immorality. Stop letting the devil use your body. That when God saved you, he repurposed you. Why are you remaining a slave to sexual immorality when the blood of Jesus has cleansed you from all unrighteousness? Are you hearing what I'm saying? Why do you keep going when you know you're bigger than that? Why do you keep taking the call when you know he ain't no good anyway? Why do you keep going out on a date when you know he's going to ask you for something else after 12? Because Big Mama told me that don't nothing come up after 12, but I'll, I'll leave that alone. He says, if there was ever a culture in which prostitution was acceptable on the basis of subjective standards... It was the church at Corinth. If you read on uh, further in verse number 15, he says, do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? That right there is heart-wrenching. He says, shall then take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? You putting yourself in something that God cleansed you from. Why accept less than your privilege? Why are you accepting less? Why you want the old model and not the new model? Oh boy, y'all have more faith in Apple than you do your relationship with God. 
you upgrade your phone quicker than you upgrade your life. So the moment Apple publishes a new phone, you out there like a junkie ready to get a new phone when your body is still broken and you've, you fail to accept that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost. And God says, I got an upgrade for you, but do you want it? You're not convinced that you're ready to give up what it takes to honor God fully. Okay, all right. See, see, when, when Paul informs us, he tells us that our bodies are united to Christ. Everybody shout, my body, my body. is united to Christ. My body's calm. That, 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 ain't, that, ain't, what, that, that ain't what that is. It's, it's a problem. It's pride. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. My body's calling me. No, 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 y'all, who's that, Johnny Gill? Oh, that's, that's, that, that ain't what that means. Your body should not be used as an instrument for evil. Paul lets us know that our bodies are good, holy, and they are valuable. That Christ owns our bodies and is interested in what we do with our body. For most Christians, the problem is in their sexuality is not a lack of of not knowing what to do. It is a lack of the integration of that knowledge. You know better, you just don't want to do better. You know what to do, you just don't know, you don't want to do what's right uh, because you, you don't, and I believe when, you're, when you are, you, you're, you're bent on doing wrong when you know you should be doing right, uh, it, it, is, it is a sign that brokenness is present somewhere. It is a sign that there is some healing that needs to take place so you can build the courage to grieve what happened. Some of you all need to have a funeral over your trauma. You're refusing to grieve it. Instead of grieving it, you excuse it and it becomes the excuse for the source of all future brokenness. Am I helping make sense today? So some of you all need to grieve what happened. You need to grieve. You need to, you need to have a funeral of it. You need, to, you need to invite God into it. And you need to ask God to help you. This is what James says uh, um, in uh, James 4 and 17. He says, if anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them, which means it's possible for someone to be doing something that's not sin for them yet because they've not been given knowledge yet. You missed what I just said, which means it's possible for someone to have a relationship with Jesus Christ and not change to the, the degree you have changed because they have a knowledge issue, which means God holds you and I responsible for what we know, not what we don't know. You know that faith comes by hearing and hearing uh, by the word of God. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by what? Every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So we understand that faith has to be, our, the word of God has to be the establishment of our faith if we want to dig deeper in our relationship with God. God does not see us in categories of our sexuality. He sees us all as his creation Deceived by sin, rebellious in nature. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And God sent me here to announce to every listener in this room, raise your hand. There is still hope for your sexuality. There is still hope for your sexuality. I, I don't know where you are on the scale, but it don't matter. There's still hope. Some of you may walk out of here and still struggle, but I want you to know there's still hope. Now, those of you are in the middle of it and you're wrestling with it, it's cool. I love the fact that you're wrestling with it, which tells me you're open to the idea that God has a bigger plan than your plan. 
there's still hope for your struggle. I'm trying to tell you that wherever you are on the scale, I'm not here to demonize you and make you feel bad about where you are because the Bible says if you see your brother or sister overtaken with a fault, ye who are spiritual, restore such a one with the spirit of meekness also evaluating yourself because it could be you. The Bible says for love covers a multitude of sins. So I'm here to tell you that if you don't get nothing else after this segment of the message, there's still hope for your sexuality. Just look at somebody on your road and say there's still hope for you. There's still hope for you. Come on, come on. I know the world has quit on you, but we're not going to quit on you. I know I know certain denominations have quit on you through your way, say you don't belong here, but I'm here to tell you there's still hope for you. I, I, I know they may not understand your pain, but it's alright. There's still hope for you. There's enough hope in this room to bring you out of your trauma. I know you're in a divorce but there's still hope. I, I, I know you've black backslidden but there's there's still hope. I, I know y'all are together and you're not married but there's still hope. I, I, know, I know your family is broken but there is still hope. I know you're single, you're grown and you're addicted to pornography but there is still hope. Everybody shout there's still hope. Come on, say it again. There's still hope. Which means that what happened to me as a little boy became the fuel of future sexual brokenness. So, so what happened to me as a little kid fueled everything else because here's what I said to myself. I'm in control now. I'm in control now. You, you don't get to take this. I'm, I'm in control now. I'm in control now. And that's where some of you are in this room. You've told yourself you're in control and you're in control, but you're broken at the same time. You're like the woman who met Jesus at the well in the text last week. She had five husbands uh, and, and she had one that she had just left and, and wasn't even married to, to, to him as well. And, and, and I believe as I was thinking about this story, I believe those relationships were what was draining her bucket. Eve, I believe that the trauma from those relationships was draining water. It was keeping her empty. It was keeping her flawed. It was keeping her broken. But, but this time, this time when she came for a refill, she was going to leave the ex at the well. And the Bible says, Pastor Billy, she left her water pot at the well, left it at the well because Jesus says, I'm going to change the source of streams of water you get. He says, the water I'm going to give you, hallelujah, you'll never run out. She left that water factory without the bucket and went and shared with everybody else, Marcina, come see a man who told me everything I had done could this be the Christ I sense in the name of Jesus to tell somebody you leaving here without a bucket today you're, you're leaving without an issue today you're leaving hallelujah and you finally gonna drop this off at the cross this is this is the best uber ride you had today because what's gonna take place is God's gonna do a drop off in the spirit he's gonna give you more hallelujah than what you asked for the Bible says the woman left I don't know why I'm pivoting to that text but I sense somebody needed to know you're heavy because what you're in is draining I'll say it one more time you're heavy because of what you're in is draining that 2 a.m. visit to that porn site is working on your soul man is doing a work on your soul that secret affair and I know we like to use the word affair because it's a cute term it makes it acceptable to culture but you don't realize that it's shaping the view of your children and how they see you it's heavy it's heavy it's heavy you're like that woman who's coming in the middle of the day because you don't think you deserve to be seen in a room with so much stain but I came to tell you you are amongst friends you're amongst brothers and sisters. You're amongst people who are delivered, who are being delivered, who will be delivered. 